Amen. And so we're going to get into some things here uh, this morning from the Word of God, and, and I believe it'll bless you and remind you of some things, but uh, my prayer is that it'll heighten your faith in who Jesus Christ is. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, are here today, and you would uh, testify to the fact that Jesus Christ has changed your life, and uh, if He hasn't come into your life yet, I pray that you would consider Him, uh, because there is no other truth than the truth of Jesus Christ, and there's no other way to be free from sin and free uh, from uh, guilt, uh, but by receiving Jesus and being washed by His blood from your sin and being right standing with God. And I think that that's the heart's desire of every human being, is to be in right standing with God. They may suppress it, they may reject it, uh, they may uh, become callous to it eventually because life uh, de uh, deals them blow after blow, but uh, when we're first uh, still born and as children, there's something in our hearts innately that says, I want to know God. And, and praise God for those of us that reach out to Him. And, and as we reach out to Him, He changes our lives and gives us new life. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And so this morning, we're going to talk about Christmas. If you were here last week, you knew I talked about hope came down. Hope came down to us, and we know that the world is full of hopelessness, and Jesus is the one who provides hope, and that God is called the God of hope. And the prayer that Paul prayed in Romans 15 is that we would abound with hope. And so we're, as believers, we should not be bound into hopelessness. Hopelessness is something uh, that God doesn't want for us. He has provided us hope, and that means an expectation, uh, an expectation of good, an expectation uh, that God is doing something and is going to do something in our lives and bring us out of whatever pit or trial or discouragement or depression we might be in right now. He desires to bring you out as you turn toward Him and pray, ask God, and then begin to speak the Word of God. He'll bring you out of whatever it is you might be into. Amen? And so he is the God of hope. Today we want to talk about, last week was hope came down. Today I want to talk about more specifically God came down. Because that's what we're talking about when we talk about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about, we're talking about him coming down. God coming down. Amen? In any case, God came down. Everybody say it with me. God came down. And uh, that is what we're celebrating, not just today, not just around the Christmas season, but all year long, we should be celebrating God came down. And so uh, let's look at a few things with this and, and see what we can get into as well. Amen? Anyway, we got it. God came down. Let's read from this uh, scripture. I'm not going to have you turn there unless you want to, but you got to go fast. I'm not going to wait for you because I don't have a lot of time, as you well know. Now, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 reads this way. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed, to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Reading on with verse 21, and she will bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, and this is a quote from Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, some six to seven hundred years before Jesus ever came. This was prophesied concerning him. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. He called his name Jesus, which uh, means Savior. He is the Savior, amen, the one that came to save us from our sins. Now, as we see a number of things with this, notice that it says by way of the prophet, it said that his name shall be called, yes, Jesus, but also they'll call him Emmanuel, which the interpretation of that is given to us here in Matthew, which means God with us. God with us or God's presence with us. And so when we talk about God came down, we're talking about God with us, God's presence with us. And I want to encourage you with this idea uh, that God is present with us right now that He is present in your heart. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, as Paul the Apostle is inspired by the Spirit of God, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. What does he mean by that? He means that in Christ's crucifixion, you and I were seen there. We were seen as having been crucified because it was on yours and my behalf that He died. And so God saw you and I as having been crucified because we deserved the 
punishment of sin. And so Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. I identify with his crucifixion, with his death, because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so he said, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Everybody say, Christ lives in me. We're talking about Emmanuel. We're talking about God with us. He says, nevertheless, I live yet, uh, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself for you because of his love for you. He gave himself for you. You know, we have to always remember, you know, uh, without, without the uh, cross, the birth was not was not successful. It wasn't enough just to have him born. Thank God he was born. We had to have him born in order to have him die. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And we had to have him die in order for us to be saved. And we had to be saved in order to be forgiven and to be in right standing with God, not by works which we've done. We cannot earn it, but by faith in his grace, we can receive that forgiveness. Amen? And a relationship with him. And so God became man. God became man in so many ways. Let's look at some things to reveal, number one, himself to us. God became man in the person of Jesus Christ in order to reveal himself to us. I'd like you to open your Bible or look at your app for a moment here. We, we want to look at a couple of scriptures before we're done, and I still have time because I'm talking fast, and uh, uh, we can get in more than the average preacher. Amen. I don't know about that, but I can do it pretty fast here. John's Gospel, chapter 1. Everybody say... John 1. John's Gospel, chapter 1. If you can turn there or look at your Bible app or whatever the case may be, we're going to read some things concerning this. Again, this idea of God became man to reveal himself to us. God wanted to reveal himself to us. Amen. Notice what it says, beginning with, and I just lost it because I was talking. Here it is, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You wonder who's the Word? Well, in verse 14, it tells us very clearly the Word became flesh in verse 14 and dwelt amongst us. And so the Word is, is a description of Jesus Christ. Amen? He's the living, walking Word of God. People say, how can Jesus be the Word? What does that mean that He's the Word? Well, the way I understand it is this, that words that we speak are expressions of our character. Words that we speak uh, help people understand who we are. And so in a similar way, Jesus is called the living Word of God. The Word became flesh. He is called God. It says the, in, the beginning was, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so he is the demonstration, or he was the living, walking expression of the character of God on earth. Are you hearing me here today? Amen? And so when it says that he is the word of God, we understand at least that part of it. There's probably much more to it than that. Uh, but he, as our words are an expression of our character and an expression of who we are, he was the living, walking expression of God as he walked on this earth because he was God. He was God in human flesh. And God the Father sent Jesus the Son in order so that we might see him for who he is. And so whenever you think of, of God and you wonder how God is, think about the life of Jesus. The life of Jesus reveals God to us. Let's just read out and, and just skip down just a few verses to verse 14 as I already quoted it. But let's go there for a moment. In John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, that's John the Baptist, bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. And let's just look at these. I'm going to uh, particularly emphasize verse 18. But verse 17 first, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. That word declared could have been translated as the word reveal. And so the Son has revealed him. The Son has revealed him. You know, years ago I gave this illustration, I'm going to give it again because it's the best one I ever heard. It's the story of a man whose family was trying to encourage him to go to a Christmas Eve service with them. 
But this man uh, was trying to, uh, you know, they, his family was encouraging him and saying, Daddy, you know, come to the Christmas Eve service with us. And he just kind of poo-pooed that. And he kind of said, you know what, I I'm not going to go. You go ahead and go. I have a hard time understanding this idea of God becoming a baby in a manger and all that kind of thing. And so the family went. And while the family is away, uh, there, there uh, comes a, a big blizzard. I mean, a snowstorm is, a, is, is going on. And the man notices out in his yard or out in his field, he notices a flock of geese out there that had been, uh, who had come down because of the storm and everything. And now they're, they're you know, freezing out there. This, this bunch of geese are out there. And so he thought to himself, I'm going to help these geese. I'm going to help them get into the barn so that they'll stay safe from the storm and not freeze to death. And so he's out there trying to give the geese all these instructions. I don't know if you've ever been around geese. First of all, geese are dangerous. I'll tell you, I know somebody had geese as watchdogs. And if you go into the yard, those geese start chasing you and spitting at you and all sorts of things. That's just a side note for entertainment purposes, all right? Uh, but anyway, and, and so he's saying, you know, he's trying to get these geese, you know, gathered together, herded, if you will, uh, to get into the barn in order to save their lives. And then the thought occurred to this man. And the thought was this, if only I could be a goose for just a few moments so I could communicate to those geese. And all of a sudden it hit him. Why did God become man? So that he could communicate to you and me and to all of humanity. He became a man so that he could come to our level and show himself to us and reveal his love to us and tell us how much he loves us and cares and show us the way to salvation and a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. And so to reveal himself to us, Jesus came. Praise God for that. Also, God became man to bring light into a dark world, which we've already mentioned to you before. Also, he became man to bring salvation. In John 3 and verse 17, it's interesting. Many times we read John 3, 16, which most of you probably can quote. It said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But then verse 17 is such an important verse. And it says, as Jesus continues in verse 17, he says, For the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but to save them who were lost. And so he did not come to condemn. He came to save. Why? He said because the world is already condemned. Those that don't know him as Lord and Savior are already under condemnation. They're already condemned for hell and eventually in eternity in the lake of fire. He didn't come to condemn them. He came to save them from a destiny apart from God in order to provide a way to bridge the gap between God and man. He put one hand on man and one hand on God and brought man together to God once again if we put faith in what Christ has done. Amen? Amen. And so to bring salvation, thank God for salvation. People say sometimes, are you saved? Saved from what? Saved from Satan's power? Because the Bible says that everyone who is uh, lost, everyone who does not know Christ, they are under the power of the enemy. They're swayed by him. They're blinded by the God of this age, which is speaking of Satan in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, and then also saved from the power of sin. Saved from the power of Satan and the power of sin so that you can be forgiven uh, for that sin. And every single one of us has broken God's law. We failed. It doesn't matter if you've uh, lied the whitest lie. It doesn't matter if you've stolen the smallest thing. You still sin before God and you need forgiveness. And God won't allow any sin into his heaven. Isn't that right? Amen. And then also God became man to give us abundant life. John 10:10. 10, 10, Jesus said the thief comes before to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This, this reflects again the love of God, the mercy of God. And again, as we refer back to the first point that he came to reveal God to us, think about the life of Christ. Think about the fact that he, that he was merciful that he was full of compassion, that he hated sickness and disease and did everything he could to minister healing uh, to those who were sick. The compassion would well up in his heart and he'd want to lay hands on people or speak the word and, and command sickness to go. There were times he raised those that were die who had died from the dead and, and brought them back to life again. Uh, there were those that were tormented in their minds with demonic spirits and Jesus would cast out the demons with his word. These are all evidences of the grace and the mercy and the love and the compassion of Almighty God. God wants people free, and He wants you free if you're bound in any way today. Amen? 
People say so much, well, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to be religious as they put it oftentimes because I don't want all these restrictions on my life. They don't understand that whatever God says don't do, He does say that in order so that you might be free. Because whatever He says don't do, He says don't do it because it'll put you into bondage every single time. He's not trying to keep anybody from enjoying life. He wants you to enjoy life, abundant life, as we just read or mentioned in John 10. Yeah, he wants you to have an abundant life, and he knows what parameters need to be on our lives in order to have an abundant life. Does that make sense to you? I mean, you put parameters, if you have children, you put parameters on your children when they're young in order so that they'll live and not kill themselves. Isn't that correct? I mean, you put parameters on them, and you say, don't do that, not because you don't love them, but because you do love them. And you want them to have an abundant life. And so that's our Father God. That's our Heavenly Father as well. And so God became man to reveal Himself to us, to bring light into a dark world, to bring salvation, to give us abundant life, and to destroy the works of the devil. In 1 John 3.8, 1 John, 1st Epistle of John, chapter 3 and verse 8, the Scripture said, for this purpose... The Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. See, the devil has been paralyzed. That word destroy means to make idle or to make inoperative. In other words, he brought back to us that will receive him as Lord the authority over the devil. The devil is no one to fear. The devil is no one to uh, try to uh, uh, run away from or, or anything like that. No, you and I, because of Christ, have authority over the devil in Jesus' name. I remember somebody said one time, oh, don't mention the devil. He might come around. Well, you know what? Let him come around because we've got authority and he knows it. And as we speak the word of God like Jesus did, it, as it's recorded in Luke 4 and Matthew 4, when the devil came to tempt him in the wilderness, uh, he spoke the word of God. And when he spoke the word of God, the devil tucked his tail between his legs and hightailed it on out of there. And when we invoke the name of Jesus and when we speak the word of God, the devil flees from us as well. Amen? Amen. And so again, he came to destroy as far as those that will receive. Somebody might say, well, it looks like the devil's doing a lot out there. Well, he is doing a lot out there in terms of those that don't know him, in terms of those that won't submit to him. But I'm talking about for us who are believers in our personal lives, we don't have to let the devil run roughshod over our lives in Jesus' name. Amen? We don't have to be afraid of any coronavirus that's of the devil. And so we just rebuke it in Jesus' name. Amen? Because Jesus, remember, his character is to heal. He never put sickness on anybody, and he never denied anybody healing that wanted it in faith. Isn't that correct? And so, again, we need to remember these things and begin to lay hold of these things by faith and fight the good fight of faith. As 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. That means everything about this abundant life, this life eternal, this life that Christ has provided for us, lay hold of it. It doesn't just fall in our laps. That it, we lay hold of it. How? By fighting the good fight of faith. And a good fight is what? A fight that you win. Amen? Amen. Now, the Lord is with you. Remember Emmanuel. God with us. Say, God with us. And so his name shall be called Emmanuel, revealing the fact that he is God. His name shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. The Lord is with you. When nothing seems to be going right, and you know this, this uh, last year, this year we're in, I'm sure that some of you have experienced things that just weren't going right. We all have. Isn't that right? I mean, that's part of life anyway, but maybe it's been, uh, you know, kind of expanded a little bit in 2020. 2020 uh, will go down in history as being one of the most difficult years throughout the entire world. But for us who are believers in Jesus Christ, it doesn't have to have a negative connotation to it. It can be a, a, a connotation, if you will, of victory. A victory. You know what? You made it through it. You got through the trials. You're still here right now. Isn't that right? And so you've got victory in Jesus Christ, and you lay hold of that, and you remind yourself of that, and be grateful. Remember, remember the old song, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Isn't that right? Sometimes we're too busy counting all the things that have gone wrong, all the trouble. Let's count the blessings. So the Lord is with you when nothing seems to go, go right. I want to read this scripture to you. I love this scripture. This is the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18. Now, before I read it, remember, Paul went through a lot of stuff. I mean, he went through, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, especially, or chapter 10, uh, it talks about all the perils he went through. I mean, the persecution was immense. And, and yet the Apostle Paul said this, 
2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18, but the Lord stood with me. Notice again, stood with me. The Lord is with us. God with us. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so notice he says that the Lord has delivered me. Now when he talks about the mouth of the lion, he's not talking literally. He's using it as a metaphor. The Lord delivered me out of the mouth of the lion. The lion no doubt referred to the persecutors, the religious leaders, the emperor, uh, Nero, the madman, the guy that was demon-possessed, killing Christians, all that kind of thing. The Lord delivered him out of the mouth of the lion, and he had faith that the Lord was going to continue to deliver him as well. Amen? Amen? Now you say, but Paul died a martyr. Yes, he did, but let me tell you something. He didn't die till he'd run his race. Some of you have heard me say that. He didn't die till God said you're done. He didn't die till God said you've done everything I've called you to do. And then the Apostle Paul in another place said, I have run the race, I have fought the good fight, I, I have finished the race. I've finished the race that's set before me, and now he was, he was ready to go. Isn't that right? It's not about you, but my confession and my belief is I'm not going home to Jesus until I'm done running the race he's laid before me. Amen? Amen. And the same thing holds true of each and every one of you. And so whenever things are going wrong, when things seem to not be going right, know that God is still with you. And not only is he with you, but he's for you. And you tap into his presence. You begin to remind yourself that greater is he who lives in you than he that's in the world. Amen? Begin to remind yourself that in Christ, that because of his love, you are more than a conqueror. Amen? And that you're an overcomer and you overcome by faith. See, Christians aren't supposed to be weak, beggarly people. Christians ought to be the strongest, most powerful people on the face of the earth. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because we've got the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We've got the creator of the universe on our side and living within us by the Spirit of the Lord. And so the Lord is with you when nothing seems to be going right. Secondly, the Lord is with you in the fire. And I gave reference, most of you know, of Daniel uh, chapter 3. And it talks about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who was that fourth man? Remember? Remember Nebuchadnezzar put him in the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow to him. And in the midst of the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar comes up and sees three men walking in there. But then he sees a fourth one. He says, who is the fourth man? And, and the witness of that was the fourth man is like unto the Son of Man. God was with them in the fire. God is with you and me in the fire. Let's never forget it. You may feel like he's not there. You may not feel his presence, but you need to remember by faith that he is in your midst. He is within you by the Spirit of God that he is there whether you feel like he's there or not. Amen? And remind yourself of that he's there. God never promised, notice up on the screen, God never promised to keep us from fire just to be with us in the fire. And so many scriptures for this, Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to talk really, 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 really fast. It says this, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. Now this applies to the church as well. I have redeemed you. You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Amen? I have called you by your name. You are mine. You belong to God. He bought you with a price, the price of his blood. Amen? You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, Emmanuel. I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. This is a promise for you and me as well. We've got a better covenant than Israel had, amen? And so we trust him in all of that, praise God. The fire represents, obviously, trials, tribulations, and persecutions. And so, uh, First Peter, I love this. All right, if I read this to you. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. If you have a Bible, you ought to underline in there, highlight it. This is a wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture. It says this, Peter, by the Holy Spirit, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice. So he's saying, don't think it's strange. You know, some people think if they're going through a trial, they must have done something wrong. Do you know if you're going through a trial, maybe you did something right. And the enemy wants to stop you, but don't let him stop you in Jesus' name. Amen? And so don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, his glory is revealed, 
when there's suffering going on, expect His glory to be revealed, that you may also be glad with exceeding joy. In the midst of trials, you ought to be glad in the, with exceeding joy if you are reproached for the name of Christ. Blessed are you. Why? Why are you blessed? Notice this. I love this. For the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, He is blasphemed, but on your part, He is glorified. He's saying this, that in the midst of persecution, reproach, in the midst of suffering for Christ, you can rejoice, you can have joy. Why? Because the Spirit of glory and the Spirit of God is resting upon you. Well, God with us. God with us. God upon us. God on our side. If God before us, Paul said one time in Romans, if God before us, who can be against us? In Jesus' name. And so, when things seem to not be going right, He's there. Amen? When, when, uh, when you're going through the fire, He is there of trials and persecution. And then the Lord is with you in the battle, no matter what the battle is. And I'm about out of time, but I thought of Judges chapter 6. In Judges chapter 6, it talks about Gideon. I love Gideon. If you haven't read about Gideon, you ought to read about Gideon in the book of Judges chapter 6. And how Gideon was, uh, you know, threshing uh, uh, wheat, I think it was, in secret because these enemies called the Midianites had invaded Israel. And, and so Israel was being suppressed, oppressed by the Midianites. And all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord, which was really God, appearing to Gideon, uh, said, said, uh, said to him, Behold, you mighty man of valor. Valor means courage. And Gideon said, uh, who, who, me? Basically. And God began to speak to him, and he said, you're going to go with, with mighty power, and you're going to defeat the Midianites. I'm going to use you to defeat the Midianites. And he said, because I am with you, Gideon. I am with you. Of course, Gideon, you know, he had to be encouraged. He had to have faith built in his heart. He said, if God is with us, uh, why have all these things happened to us? And some of you probably said the same thing. If God is with me, why has all this happened to me? But God didn't even pay attention much to that question. God just said, you're going to defeat the Midianites because I'm with you. He didn't try to answer the question. He just said, I'm with you, so be quiet and know I'm with you, and I'm going to use you to defeat the enemy. Amen? Amen. Because we don't need to know all the answers. The real answer to that is this. The reason why the Midianites had overcome the Israelites is because the Israelites have forsaken God. God didn't forsake them. They forsook God. How many of you know God won't ever forsake you? He said He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But sometimes we forsake Him. Sometimes we put Him on the back shelf, if you will. Sometimes we've not put him in the forefront of our lives and made Him first. And then we wonder why are things going wrong many times. Not always. Sometimes it's just because we got an enemy that hates our guts. Isn't that right? But other times it's because we've gotten away. We've gone our own way. We've gone our, and made our own decisions. We've made decisions that sometimes we knew God wasn't approving of. Isn't that right? And then we get in trouble and then we realize I need to repent. I need to get back on track with God. And then God shows up again because Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us every single day, every time. And remember that when you're going through the next trial, the next fire. Remember that when you're going through the battle of temptation, whatever it might be. Remember that he is Emmanuel. God with you and in you and for you every single time. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank You for helping us to remember who You are, for helping us to remember that Jesus Christ is still within us by the Spirit of God, that He has come to dwell within us. As Paul said, Christ lives in us. And He lives in us by the Spirit of the Lord that has now indwelt us and, and changed us on the inside. Father, I pray for that one that might be going through a battle. I pray, Father God, that they would begin to see you in them and realize that you are bigger than any situation. I pray for that one who's uh, suffering from depression or discouragement or sickness or disease, and I command those things to leave them in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father God, we thank you that we are victorious. We thank you we're not weak, but we're strong in you. We thank you that we can overcome any obstacle because, again, Father God, we overcome by faith in your word. Our God is greater. Our God is the creator. The creator of the universe is our heavenly Father, and if he's on our side, he can do whatever in order to bring us through to the other side of whatever situation there is. Father God, I thank you for making that a reality to each and every one today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, as we have said over and over again, this is a special time for us to celebrate the birth of a baby. 
But that baby was special. That baby had no human father. Born of a virgin. You say, how can that be possible? With God, all things are possible. He came up with the idea of how babies come in the natural. Why can't he do it differently if he wants to? Isn't that right? And so that babe, born of a virgin, had no natural father. Therefore, he did not have sin because sin is passed on by the father. Sin nature is passed on by the natural father. But him not having a natural father, he had the heavenly father. He was born without a sin nature, sinless. God became man so that he could bear your judgment in your stead. So that he could bear the punishment that you and I deserved as our substitute. And you know, the Bible says that if he died for us, shouldn't we live for him? I want you to ask yourself the question. Are you living for Jesus Christ today? Have you accepted Him as Lord and Savior? Maybe you have. But the next question is, have you lived for Him? Have you given Him your life, really? Or have you just prayed a prayer and said, I believe Jesus died for me and He rose again from the dead. Well, are you living for Him? Or are you living in your own way? Have you made your own choices, your own decisions? Or do you inquire of the one who you have called Lord and Master, uh, because, you, you know, that is what that means. When he's master and Lord, that means it's not about what you want to do. It's what he wants you to do from that day forward. Amen? And I would venture to say most people who have made Jesus their Lord have not made him their Lord in terms of everyday life. But there's others that have never even given their life to Christ. And as I said, the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're coming into a new year, the year 2021. If you're an unbeliever, if you've never accepted Christ, it's a time to start believing. It's a time to give Him your life. If you are a believer and you've lived your own life without, without really surrendering to Him, it's time to say, God, I've tried it on my own and now I want to do it your way. Forgive me. And so I'm just going to do this. If you would, let's pray this prayer. We're going to cover it all right now. The whole house just pray in this prayer. God in heaven, I thank you that Jesus came as God in the flesh, the perfect man, sinless in himself, so that he could bear my sin and my punishment, which I deserved. And so today, I surrender my life to live for you. I turn from my own way. I turn from sin. And Jesus, I turn to you. And I confess you again. Jesus is my Lord. I believe with all my heart that you not only died, but you rose again. Come and live in me. Change me. Guide me. I surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give God thanks right now, shall we? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time or the first time you ever accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have stuff that we want to give you. And so I encourage you to let me know or uh, let one of the ushers know. We'll make sure that you get this uh, packet that we have for you that has a New Testament in it and other information. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's not the end. It's not like some people refer to fire insurance, which says, well, now I'm not going to hell. No, it's only the beginning. Because you know what? Just speaking a prayer doesn't make you saved. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That may be a first step. But you know what? If it doesn't change anything, then we have to wonder if it was sincere. And God knows for sure whether it was or not. Amen? And so let us know if you've accepted Christ for the first time. Maybe you had to recommit today. Whatever the case may be, it's time to live for Jesus. It's time to ask Him what He wants out of our lives. Because the days uh, are dangerous days that we live in. But with Him, we can approach each day with faith and confidence. Amen? Because we've got Him on our side. Praise God. Amen. God is good. If you've been blessed by this message today, please prayerfully consider giving to help support the ministry of Abounding Grace Christian Church. No gift is too small, and we'll agree with you in prayer that God will continue to bless you richly for your support. If you'd like to give online, go to agcc.church. The link is found below, and look for the green tab near the top that says Give Online. Or you can send your gift by mail to the address also below. 
Thank you so much, and God bless.